break, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God. You have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, I say, you name the kid high, oh God. You have done great things. Well, good morning and welcome to Cornerstone Neighborhood Church. We are so happy to have you joining with us today. As we continue in worship this morning, let's focus our hearts and our minds around these verses in Psalm 95, verses 1 to 2. It says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. So as we join together this morning, let's give thanks uh, above all. Uh, and if you're tuning in with us this morning, we are having communion today. Uh, so make sure you get ready, uh, have your bread and your cup ready uh, so that we can participate in communion together this morning. Let's continue to worship together.
everyone. Um, for those of you who haven't met me or don't know me, my name is Rebecca Dick. I'm the new children's coordinator for Cornerstone. I'm just going to share a couple of announcements and updates for the fall. Um, so Cornerstone Kids will begin again on October 4th when we start meeting at Webster's Corners Elementary School. Parents, we're having a meeting on September 28th at the 240th Tim's at 745. Um, on the same note, if you are not a parent but have questions or concerns or ideas about our children's programming, please come. Um, we can sit down and we can discuss it. Um, it would be really great to see everyone. Um, coffee's on me, so there's always free coffee if you decide to come. Um, volunteers, I just wanted to say thank you for anybody who's reached out reached out to me um, and has been willing to volunteer in our children's ministry. It's greatly appreciated. Um, if you would like to volunteer, please contact me and I can get everything set up um, so you're able to do that. Um, we're going to be having a volunteer meeting on the morning of October 4th at 9.30 at Webster's Corners just before our service begins. We're just going to be covering some new protocols um, regarding safety, going over some old protocols, and um, just getting everything kind of set up for the fall. Um, this Sunday is Freedom Sunday. It is an initiative run by the organization IJM. It works to protect people against different forms of slavery. Um, there's currently over 40 million people globally um, caught in slavery, with a quarter of the forced labor being children. Um, so I'd just like to take a moment and pray for this organization and pray for our upcoming plans in the fall. So if you just bow your head with me and we can take a moment to pray. Heavenly Father, um, I just wanted to thank you um, for IJM. This organization is working hard to free these children and free these people who are currently caught in slavery, Lord. Um, I just ask that you would give, give these people in charge wisdom um, on how to protect them and the best ways to serve them. Um, I just pray for anybody right now who is... Um, who is currently having people in slavery um, under them, who are the oppressors. I ask, Lord, that you would just change their hearts um, and give them the strength to move away from that, whether that be loss of money for their business, um, and just help these people. These people so desperately need help, Lord, and they so desperately need you. Um, any of them who who don't know you, who haven't met you, Lord, I ask that you would just um, start a work in their heart, Lord, that they would um, begin to know you and begin to develop a relationship with you, Lord. Um, so I thank you for that, and I thank you for this time, Lord, just to um, focus on on slavery and the different different issues that are still very real and very present in our world that sometimes it's easy to forget, and um, it shouldn't be forgotten. Um, so I just I pray that you would be with this organization and um, all these people caught in slavery. I pray for children's ministry upcoming in the fall, Lord. I thank you um, for everybody who's willing to help with this. I thank you for our congregation, for their continual prayers. Um, and I just pray that we would be able to serve these kids in a really meaningful and impactful way. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, and um, I hope to meet you guys in person sometime soon. Okay. At this time, we're going to pray for the offering. Uh, and I would like to encourage you to continue giving, uh, even during these times of isolation. Um, there are many different ways that we can help you with that, uh, whether that is through uh, Tithely online uh, on our giving page on the website, uh, or you can contact uh, Brent or Darlene, and we would be happy to help you, uh, whether through one-time donations, uh, checks, whatever. Uh, we would love to be able to assist you in, uh, in the giving of your finances uh, to God. Um, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we lift this offering up to you uh, as, as a blessing to you. Uh, Father, we, we just pray that, that you would find it as such. Uh, God, we just continue to ask that, uh, that you, would, you would be using our our gifts, Father, to, to expand your kingdom, Father, that new people would be hearing of you, uh, and God, that we would be able to, 
to help fuel those efforts in, in your kingdom, whether here in Maple Ridge uh, or around the world. In your name we pray. Amen. Welcome once again uh, to our study of God's Word. Today I want to continue in our new series. Of course, we're heading into the fall, and it is, it's official now. We are officially in the autumn season. Now, how do we know that? Is it because earlier in the week, the uh, autumnal equinox occurred? You know, that time in which the plane of the Earth's equator passed through the geometric center of the sun's disk, 
that moment at which the center of the visible sun is directly above the equator. Is that, is that the official reason why we can say we're in fall? Or is it maybe something more cultural? Uh, this week, I learned that one can now purchase pumpkin spice craft dinner. And of course, last week I mentioned about getting beyond the pumpkin spice, those nice things of the Thanksgiving season to, to really think about whether we are thankful. And that is the title of our uh, sermon series, Thankful, uh, looking for evidence of gratitude in the life of a Christian. And we're looking for solid proof uh, that in fact we are thankful, not just on the superficial uh, surface level, uh, you know, Thanksgiving uh, feelings and thoughts that we will have at this season, which is quite understandable. Uh, but we've been, we've undertaken this look at the um, letters of the Apostle Paul. Now, granted, we noted last week that Tite, his letter to Titus and to the Galatian church doesn't have material uh, surrounding a Thanksgiving theme specifically. But all of Paul's epistles uh, contain a lot of material uh, that is either uh, describing his gratitude or encouraging Christians to live a life of thankfulness. In 1 Thessalonians 5.18, we are taught to give thanks in all things in all circumstances. This is God's will for us. This is how God has designed for us to live the Christian journey. So Paul's teaching on Thanksgiving can be arranged in various ways, but I've chosen to assemble these various scriptures, obviously uh, not in those two books that I've mentioned, but other scriptures uh, that are around seven main themes. Now, last week, we looked at the theme of joy. And I suppose if we could say, you know, if you looked at the crime scene of your life over this last week, could you see evidence there of joy? Because if there's joy present in the life of the Christian, this is one of the markers uh, that we are in fact living a life of gratitude and thankfulness. Today, I want to look at the theme of submission. Now, it doesn't sound as fun as joy, but it is just as important as an indicator that a Christian is walking a life of thanksgiving. So I want us to watch two things. Uh, first of all, we're going to watch our posture, and then we're going to watch uh, our practice. How is your posture? Let me read uh, from Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. This will sound so very familiar to many of us, but these are important words from Paul. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, we saw already in the words from 1 Thessalonians 5.18 that God working in us a thankful lifestyle is his will for us. And again, we're talking about now his will. So what is our posture uh, as it relates to the will of God? Now, posture in the physical sense is uh, the, the way in which we carry our bodies in, either in standing or sitting. I had good posture after an experience where uh, in the summer I went through a lot of military drill. We were taught to stand up tall and straight and to really have a good posture. Over the years, as I've sat at my desk, my posture has become more hunched and I have a physiotherapist reminding me, uh, straighten up, stretch out, have a good physical posture. Well, what is our spiritual posture? How are we carrying our heart in relationship 
to God's will for us. Well, Paul is clearly telling us in these two verses that we need to have a posture of submission. Now, his choice of words is very important. Paul urged uh, us here in this passage. Uh, in, um, in the NIV, we have urge. Uh, the word could be translated beseech or admonish. It's very strong and it's very uh, compelling, this call to offer ourselves as a sacrifice to God. That's the other word that is important to note, a sacrifice or an offering. And to me, it suggests in, in the absence of specific word thanksgiving here in these verses, but it suggests a thank offering or a response to God of appreciation. Notice that it's God's mercy, it's God's grace, uh, not just the context for us to uh, offer our lives a living sacrifice to him, but in fact, he's the power and the uh, gives us the capability of doing so. You know, Paul identified this offering quite literally here as a, as a logical or a reasonable service that we would offer to God. It's, it's our way of showing God that we worship him. Listen to what William Temple describes as worship. He puts it this way. Worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open up the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. And it's this last phrase from William Temple's definition that I think is very helpful in us understanding what Paul is urging here. Our worship response to God quite reasonably, logically, appropriately is one of offering our whole lives in submission uh, to all that God has for us. When we submit to God, we're making progress in gratefulness. When we live a life where our life's posture, our, the posture of our heart is, is devoted to whatever God's will is for us, not only is that something that God has created within us by his grace, but it shows, it reveals a life of gratitude and thanks and thankfulness. I really appreciate these words by Grace Maristang, and I'm unsure where I came across them, but I have marked them down uh, some time ago, and they seem very appropriate here as she comments as to our view of God as royalty. Uh, contrasted with maybe somebody who's just a celebrity. Listen to what she says. We seem to understand celebrity much better than royalty. The recognition of celebrity is an almost passive activity. The spectator needs not to be involved to enjoy some of the passing entertainment benefits. Royalty, on the other hand, demands recognition of power and destiny and the submission of involvement. Royalty is what the majesty of Christ is about. That is why we respond to the call, crown him with many crowns. We crown him in recognition of who he is, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords. In recognition, we submit to the Lord of love, the Lord of life, the Lord of heaven, the Lord of time. Recognition of royalty asks for our involvement in worship. This is precisely what Paul has done in these two powerful verses. He has called us to recognize the royalty, the sovereignty, uh, the supreme rule of God who having saved us now quite appropriately expects us to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in submission to him. And I would submit to you that this is a beautiful and, and powerful picture of a life of thankfulness. 
You know, verse 2 uh, in Romans 12 goes, uh, tw- uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, just goes on to maybe expand on what this looks like. We're told here that we're not to conform or we're not to allow our lives to be molded according to the shape and pattern of the world. Instead, we're told uh, to be that we are to be, by God's power, metamorphosized, quite literally, is the word Paul used. We're to be transformed. And that occurs when God re, uh, does a, a powerful, uh, Holy Spirit-driven work of renewing our minds. And as we do that, what is happening? Uh, right at the end of this verse, uh, Paul is saying, then you'll be able to test and approve, or you'll be able to reveal the, the beauty of, and and the uh, and the um, um, perfection of God's will for you, First Thessalonians five eighteen, God wills for you and for I to live a life of thankfulness as we submit to Him. What can we do? We can live out His will. Submission is a wonderful way of giving evidence that we are in a thankful relationship with our Heavenly Father. I was reading a book by the uh, devotional writer Andrew Murray, and I thought he made a very interesting comment as he was dealing with the the fact that we might be fearful and hesitant to submit to God's will. He makes this comment, just look again at how beautiful the will of God makes everything in nature. Ask yourself, Now that he loves and blesses you as a child, if it is right to distrust him, the will of God is the will of his love. How can you fear to surrender yourself to it? You know, this past Monday, I had an opportunity to be in nature or at least on uh, the waters of Burrard Inlet. And then I paddled up um, Indian Arm and I was blown away with uh, several factors. Uh, There were hundreds, probably thousands of jellyfish that I saw. I joked that there was more jelly out there. Uh, I saw more jelly that day than at a Baptist potluck. Uh, I saw um, seals and birds. And and I think the thing that uh, captivated me the most was the stillness of the day. This is uh, inland waters, uh, of course, but this is ocean water. And it was as glass for hours and hours as I paddled my kayak. And there were a number of occasions where I was just in awe of what God had set in order, how he had made his will perfected in the natural world. Should we not also expect that he can perfect his will in us. What does that require? Well, it requires us to bow in reverent, worshipful submission to him. So that's the posture of our hearts, and that's very important. But moving on to our practice, uh, I would invite you over to just one other passage for today, and that's in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5. And we're going to find this link again of God's will for us, God's will for how he will uh, allow our lives to be thank offerings to him. Ephesians chapter 5, let me read from verse 18 to 21. Paul writes to the Ephesian church, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Sing and make music in your heart to the Lord always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, in addition to our posture, we have to watch our day-to-day practice. In the preceding verses, uh, Paul has uh, contrasted light and darkness. In verse 8, he says, once upon a time, you, you were living in darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. So live as children of light. And then in verse 17, here we have our linkage with God's will for us. Verse 17, don't be foolish, but understand 
what the Lord's will is. And then Paul says these verses that I've just read for you, that we need to live our lives with a very careful day-to-day practice. What is required for us to do so? Well, there's a rejection that has to happen, and then we will see some wonderful results. Paul says, do not get drunk on wine. Now, before we rush into this passage and simply see Paul saying, maybe you shouldn't drink, it's wrong to drink alcohol, there's something quite a bit bigger at stake here. First of all, Paul is using what we call synecdoche, um, using the part for the whole. Have, have, Have you ever said to someone, do you have wheels? Now, you don't mean that you're curious if they just have a few wheels alone, you want to know, do they have transportation, a car or bicycle, motorcycle, whatever uh, you are envisioning, but you just say the word wheels. And I think Paul is doing exactly that here. He's talking about wine, um, but he's really speaking of the whole of how we can get distracted or really how our lives can become submitted to something or someone uh, and and our submission to God will be compromised. In fact, there's an historical context. Uh, Paul may well have had in mind the Greek god uh, Dionysus. In Roman uh, pagan worship, was named Bacchus. But uh, Dionysus was uh, understood to be a god of wine, grape cultivation, fertility, um, religious ecstasy, and so there was this uh, wastedness and wantedness that was connected with the worship of uh, Dionysus. And Paul uses a word that has this idea of excess or squandering. He he, uh, used that here in verse 18. He says, don't get drunk with wine, which leads to debauchery. It may well have been a reference to those who felt, even as Christians, they still could participate in these pagan uh, festivals and all of the drunkenness that went with that. Now, he might have been referencing that one example, but it really is just one example that stands for many, many ways in which we can allow our lives to be given over to some pursuit uh, at best, at worst, to to some addiction. Some of those pursuits might well be very, very good. Uh, Sometimes people are pursuing things like um, a healthy lifestyle and activity and recreation, and those are good things. But if we're not careful, they can start to to control our lives. and, And in that way, we have submitted control of our lives to to those pursuits. Of course, whether it's uh, alcohol, uh, drugs, other addictive practices, uh, uh, those are clear examples of how we can give our lives over. So Paul is concerned here not to tell Christians don't drink, but he's concerned to tell Christians, hey, with the most obvious example of drinking, especially in the festival of worship to Dionysus, beware. You can give your life over in your day-to-day practice to something or someone that will take you away from this all-important, vital relationship with Jesus. What is the answer? The answer, first of all, is to reject that and to accept the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives in a day-to-day practical manner. In contrast to allowing someone else or something else to control our lives, Paul makes this appeal, let the Holy Spirit fill you. Quite literally, he's writing, be being filled. I know that's awkward in English, but it is the work that the Holy Spirit does in our hearts, so it's something that he's doing uh, to us, and so we're being filled by him, and it's it's an ongoing process, a day-to-day practice that we need to pursue. And there's some some wonderful results. Now, notice verses 18 to 21 in the original language; it's all one sentence, so there's no um, um, 
uh, break between verse uh, 20 and 21. So I'm including verse 21 in these results. Let me quickly just tell you these wonderful results if we allow the Holy Spirit to fill our lives day by day in our practice. First of all, verse 19, we'll have sincere joy, which comes from our heart, and it brings blessing to others. It's particularly uh, concerning the, the speaking and the singing and literally the psalming of spiritual worship songs. And uh, as, as we take joy in that, the overflow of that joy will bless others because we're not told to go into a, a, a closet and sing to yourself. We're told, take all of the wonderful enriching melody and, and truth of worship, uh, worship music, and, and share it with one another. So encourage one another. So it's a joy that comes from our heart and it blesses others. And a second result is a constant gratitude to God, which encompasses, encompasses all of life. Verse 20, always giving thanks to God for everything. That's all encompassing. That's about our day-to-day -day practice. Of course, it is not restricted to one Thanksgiving day a year. In fact, Every day should be a thanksgiving day for the Christian because we're told always in everything, this is God's desire for us to be thanking him in the name of Jesus. And then lastly, this will also result in a practical harmony with other believers that will bring honor to the name of Christ. Verse 21, submit to one another. Our submission to God has everything to do with us being able to have practical, harmonious working relationships with one another. Submit to one another. Why? Because um, it's easy? No. Because it's convenient? Certainly not. Um, because it's more effective? Not always. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. As we're submitted to him, that will translate into us being able to submit to one another. And we're talking about harmonious, uh, cooperative, collaborative teamwork in the body of Christ. Watch your posture. Watch your practice. If you want to look at some more of these notes, uh, please do visit the Digging Deeper document. We have that on our website on the sermon page, and you can download that PDF and research a little bit more about these scriptures. You know, God is inviting every believer into a lifelong worship relationship with himself. Romans 12 verse 1 in the message paraphrase says this, God helping you take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering of worship. I hope that this theme of submitting ourselves to God, to, to giving him our most logical, worshipful response to all his grace in our lives, not only conditions every day, but also gives us such reason to be together this morning for communion. I want to offer a word of welcome to communion. Now, it's quite fun today to think that the Greek word for be thankful, uh, eucharisto, has been um, transliterated in and in many um, church traditions. They will actually use the word eucharist to refer to the communion. We talk about the Lord's table or we refer to it as communion celebration, but in many um, churches, they will use the term Eucharist, which means thanksgiving or th giving of thanks. And I welcome you to this thanksgiving table, S highlighting, uh, worshiping, uh, putting front and center the gracious, loving sacrifice of the Lord Jesus for our sins. So I welcome you to this time of communion. I hope you at home watching this video will uh, have uh, some items there, a, a bit of 
juice and some bread so we can celebrate together. I also want to offer a warning. This is something that Paul did in particular with the Corinthians church as they got careless about communion, as they got a sloppy in their um, and, and ir almost irreverent in how they reflected on the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus. So we do need to take warning. It's a good moment to ask ourselves, am I submitted to God? Is there an area of my life where I've been saying, no, wait a minute, God, I don't mind you in these departments of my life, but in this area, I just want to hang on to that. And, and that is not appropriate. It's, it's not a logical way for us to be responding to the grace and the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. Think of his body broken for us. Think of his blood spilled for our forgiveness. Now is a good time just to take a moment and, th and to repent and to confess and to experience the cleansing power of Christ's blood. I want to invite you to take a portion of bread and just have it available. And I just want to ask God to bless um, what we're sharing together virtually today. Lord, this piece of bread so simple in its physical form, but so powerful as it speaks for us today of your body broken for us. We ask that you'd bless it. We ask that you would, you know, even as our body is going to take a, a, a bit of nourishment from, from this physically, that as we feed on you today, the truth of who you are, how you have sacrificed yourself for us, how willingly you endured knowing full well the extent of our sin and rebellion. And yet you uh, pursued this goal of reconciling us to God through your bro broken body. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We ask your blessing upon this bread. We'll partake in a moment, but I also want to give thanks for the cup. I have just a small cup of grape juice here. Um, what a, again, a, a, an amazing picture for us. So let's ask God's blessing on it. God, we, we just hold in our hands a bit of juice. Maybe some have a little bit of wine and, and we're just thinking about, you know, how the grapes were crushed and bruised and broken so that this um, beverage could be provided to us. And in such a more profound and wonderful way, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to bleed, to, to let your very lifeblood flow because you loved us so dearly. You wanted us to know what it means to be free and forgiven. And so we celebrate your grace purchased for us by the, your very blood. We thank you. We ask your blessing upon this cup today, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Just before we partake, I want to just back up in the book of Romans and just read a, a, a blessing, a, a celebration that Paul utters. And I think that as he's thinking through all of the things he wants to say and share with his dear friends in Rome, and help them in their journey. He just can't help it, but, but blurt out this praise to God. And so listen to this praise. Join me in your heart in praising God, and then we'll take the bread and the cup together. Oh, the depth and riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord who, or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's celebrate together in the taking of this bread. We do it in celebration in submission to him in acknowledgement of all that he suffered on our behalf let's take this 
in remembrance of Jesus. Today, let's also take the cup in celebration, in submission to him, in recognition of all that it cost Jesus for our redemption. Let's take this cup together in remembrance of Jesus. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this message um, from Paul throughout so many of his letters, calling us as your followers to just live a life of thankfulness. Lord, above all, in the turmoil of our world today, in the difficulties in each of our individual lives and families and workplaces and schools, would you just continue to, by your grace, produce in us authentic gratitude, real thankfulness, a, a real sense of appreciation first and foremost for your body broken, your blood shed, so that we might be saved. And then, Lord, I pray that would overflow so that we would be a blessing to others, that we would be servants to those in our community, that we would show the love of Jesus, we would live his life, and we would share his life as you've called us to do. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you today.
As we close out our service this morning, uh, I want to leave you with these words uh, from Psalm 95, verses 3 to 5. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. As you go about your day today, I encourage you to just give all of your praise and all of your thanks to God. Well, before you leave today, I just want to give you a few announcements. Uh, again, check out our Facebook, our website, and our YouTube channel to stay updated throughout the weeks. Uh, also, make sure you're reading through your Cornerstone Connector. Uh, that is going to give you uh, the information you need uh, each week. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to fill out a Connect card. Uh, as well as uh, feel free to just give Brent a call at our office uh, and he'd be happy to give you uh, answers to any of your questions. Um, also tonight we're having our special general meeting uh, at 7 o'clock uh, on Zoom so make sure you're checking your Cornerstone connector uh, for that information uh, to get into that meeting. Um, if you have any questions just feel free to ask Brent uh, or any of our board members to try to get, uh, make sure that you are getting into that meeting tonight. Um, and uh, next week uh, for church, we'll be having our first week again uh, at Webster's Corners School. And so we we're very much excited about that and we would love if you could join us. Um, that's all for today. I hope you have a great day. Uh, take care. God bless.